little bit about how you can put a pitch together to raise money for your game. Uh, just so I know who's in the audience, you know how many people have shipped a game before? One or two? Who's currently looking for funding? Who's just still sitting here because they didn't leave the last talk? A few people as well? Okay, well, if you've got questions as we go along, feel free to, uh, to, to throw them at me about anything, I guess. Um, really what I want to talk about is how do you think about beginning to pitch for money? What are the questions you need to ask yourself? How to get ready? Um, how do you think like an investor? I think this is probably the most common mistake you, know, you don't get into video game development because you want to go look for money, you get into video game development because you love games and you want to make games. Uh, unfortunately, this is part of the process, and the best chance to give yourself the most opportunities to make good games is to use someone else's money to make those games, and you can afford to keep working on games for as long as possible, so you don't get to my age and you're working for a service provider because you've got a baby at home, okay? So that's why it's important to invest raise other people's money. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the pitch, we'll talk about how uh, the things that I see wrong most of the time, and we'll talk about the things that you can do well. Just as background, we have a product called the Exola Funding Club, and as part of that process, I evaluate the games. Um, I've probably seen over two or 3,000 pitches in the last five to 10 years of my career, so I know a little bit, but probably not everything. Um, so the first thing I always say to people is, you know, what do you want? And a lot of people just go, well, I just want to get some money together. Uh, just give me that cash, right? But you really need to be thinking about what is the money going to allow you to do? Because until you can crystallize this process and understand what you need to pitch to that publisher or investor, you're going to have a very, very broad uh, kind of net that you're throwing out there. And most likely, you're just never going to find the match because they're looking for something very specific. Um, so you need this kind of mission. You know, Simon Sinek, the kind of business guru, he talks about a why. Why are you doing this? And what's driving your studio or your game development forward? So it can be whatever you want. This is one I just put together, I think probably because I was doing a talk in uh, Estonia or something. And it really just starts where you are. And the reason that this is important, because you can think a little bit like your finance, like nutrition. And, you know, you've got a sumo wrestler, you've got a ballet dancer, they're both athletes, but they have very different nutritional requirements to achieve and perform. And if the sumo wrestler or the ballet dancer starts eating like a sumo wrestler for six months before the Olympics, he or she's probably not going to be very successful. And the reason I use this analogy is because you need to have your funding aligned with the vision for your studio. So if you're looking to make cool premium PC games, and you're going to VCs and you're saying, hey, we need $25 million, that's not really a match. That's the wrong diet, it's the wrong nutrition. You're not going to get the money that you want or to the places you want to go. So, yeah, I think I said that already. Um, so, again, this is like a really, really big thing. I think that if you're a game developer, it's hard to kind of get out of the space. Like, you're in the game so much, it's really hard for you to see it, and you're very creative and you just want to make games, and it's sometimes hard to see the perspective of an investor or publisher and what they're kind of looking for um, in a particular game. So I think, as I said before, we have a baby at home. I think our baby's great. I love our baby. But when I see photos of other people's babies, I just don't really care about their babies. Right? And your game is a little bit like your baby. Right? And publishers, investors, they look at games basically professionally. All day, they're looking at games, new babies, and they're trying to work out whether they think this is a cool one or not. And increasingly, there's a huge amount of competition. So these are games that shipped in 2022 on Steam, right? And these are the games that made it. So there's a whole stack of games that didn't make it, and there's an even bigger stack of games that didn't get past pitching. So you really got to be quick to get their attention, and you've got to understand that they're looking at a lot of these things and they're trying to find certain pieces. And it may be that yours isn't a right fit. But again, don't expect your passion to kind of immediately rub off on them for this project. You've got to be able to speak to them in their language very quickly. Otherwise, they're going to move on. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that in more detail, but... I think another thing a lot of people misunderstand with investors or publishers is they have a pretty clear kind of area they like to invest in. It's a space they understand, 
and they're really just looking for more things in that area. They believe that their edge is they can better pick you know, a narrative-driven premium PC game than the competition. So if you come to them with an MMO, they're going, oh, this isn't really what we're looking for. And this kind of comes to the next point, there's like, you can have a really great game that is just a bad investment for them. And that's got nothing to do with the game, it's just that there's a big mismatch. This is kind of like the dire sumo wrestler versus the uh, ballet dancer. It's just the wrong fit at that point in time. And uh, that's not a reflection of the quality of your game at any point. So yeah, who's the audience for the pitch? This is again a big mistake I see quite commonly, and you've got to remember that it's the investor. You know, it's not like Reddit user number 627 Battle Axe 22. You're not trying to convince someone to play your game specifically. You're trying to convince them that there's an audience for your game and that they should invest in your studio. So even though you're spending a lot of time saying, hey, how cool this game is, what they're really looking to see from your deck is, well, what's the market for the game? Are there enough people that are going to play this game? You know, what other games are there that are a lot like this game? What are the chances that people move from these other games to your game? So again, you can have like a great, great game, but it's just in a very busy and saturated space. Maybe it was something that was really hot and cool two or three years ago. The shine's worn off, and now they're kind of saying, hey, this is not the best food for us right now. I managed to do a pretty bad job on these slides somehow. Um, there's two levers of risk, I would say, that publishers and investors are looking to reduce as much as possible. The first thing is, is there an audience for this game? Are there people that are going to play it? And the second thing is, can you ship this game? So most of what you're trying to do in a pitch is convince them, persuade them, that you can fulfill both of these criteria. So you're showing them, hey, this is the market, and this is why we're the best people to make this game right now. Any questions on that so far? Just too brilliantly explained the whole way through. No one needs any further clarification. Okay, so this is now the probably the most important part. This is your pitch. Um, so what I'll do is I'll run through some slides and we'll show you some sort of good examples of how it can look, and then I'll show you some bad examples. And the bad examples I've basically taken, protected the identity of the guilty a little bit, but these are real examples that we've seen, and a lot of them quite recently as well. So again, in the same way to understand that the, uh, the audience for your pitch isn't gamers, it's the investors or the publishers, the other thing to understand is that they're not going to look at your pitch and say, hey, here's $5 million or whatever it is, okay? They're going to look at the pitch and they're going to be working out how they can say no, and if they can't say no, then they're going to say, hey, let's have another conversation. And this is really important at this point because the whole point of the pitch is to make it really hard for them to say no. But it's also important to understand that you don't need to include everything about your project at this point in the conversation. So a game design document is extremely important for your game, but it's not important for a pitch. Right? A full budget that maps out exactly where you're going to spend the money over the next two and a half years until you ship is really important but it's not important for this point of the pitch. And what you're trying to do is get this next conversation where it's been really hard for them to say no, and they go, you know what, we need to find out a little bit more about this project, and that's when they say, hey, we want to dive into the game design document. Show us the budgeting. You know, that's when they're going to start saying, hey, let's look at the build. And that's really the purpose of the pitch, is you just want to get to the next conversation. And if you put too much information in here, you know, the deck's 145 slides, and it's all of your game design stuff and the full budget. The people doing the screening most likely are just going to go like, this is too difficult, and they'll move on. They just have too many choices. Um, so this is some slides that I'd recommend you to put in every deck. You can have more than this, but I'd say this is like a bare minimum of where you want to start. Um, shouldn't be more than 15 slides and probably between 10 and 15 is the sweet spot. Okay, elevator pitch. So this is a real example from a game. Um, 
that we invested in or some people that we know invested in and uh, it's got very very high ratings on Steam and this is basically how they opened their pitch so this is a real world example the game's called Lost in Play by Happy Juice Games really really fun game and so this is you know one sentence and it's some sort of visual content that immediately draws you in and makes you feel like, I kind of feel like I know the emotional texture of this game and I'd like to understand how they're going to pull this off. Right? So it should be like kind of immediately drawing you in, making someone feel the emotion of what it's like to play the game and then it gives me a visual aspect or a visual cue of what type of game this is going to be. Right? Like this isn't a first person shooter and I can tell that immediately. Right? So what they shouldn't look like is this, okay? So I just wrote this one up, but again, and it's not that this isn't maybe part of what you've been on the journey to get to your kind of elevator pitch. It's just people aren't really gonna read this and it's just gonna get too difficult. Like I can't really tell anything about this game just by reading this, it's leaving way too much to my imagination. Key features and USPs, you need the core game loop, something about what makes this game different, why would people play this, why is it not something I've already seen, what games are they playing now, where are they going to come from, why would they switch, you know, some sort of USP around the game. Um, the USPs are really, really difficult, so, um, I just kind of made these ones up. You know, it's not these are super great, but what I wanted to show in the next slide is some examples of of where people really get this wrong, and it's not immediately obvious that it's wrong until you kind of show a bit of the opposite. So, here's some like pretty common USPs I see in pictures, and these are really not good because. This doesn't tell me anything about the game, all right? And the way to think about this is if you take the opposite of these USPs, they just don't mean anything. And so it's not that inspiring gameplay is a bad thing, obviously it's not. It's just so generic that it's not a USP anymore because no one's running around pitching, you know, average graphics and a dull soundtrack and the rest of this. This is really hard to get right. Okay, expect it to take a lot of time and expect it to be quite painful. So credit to Rami Ismail, a great resource for anyone that's looking for some, like a press kit he's done, a really good um, newsletter that he has on indie gaming. And this is actually something I read in, in his newsletter once, this opposites example, which I found really helpful to kind of crystallize what's wrong with those USBs. Okay, position and marketing fit. Like one thing you want to do as much as possible is communicate visually, right? So there's um, a lot of software out there where you can send a pitch and it's going to show you how long people are looking at it. When we were raising money as a metaverse company a couple of years back, you know, it would be like three seconds, two seconds, three seconds, four seconds. If someone spent more than a minute on a slide, we just assumed that they got distracted and started doing something else and then came back to it. And the reason this is kind of important is if you can tell your ideas, get your ideas across visually, then it can be very, very quickly be absorbed. And what you're looking to do here with a positioning and market fit is basically show some of the games that are in your space, give some axes, and then show kind of what separates you. Like where do you fit in this landscape? And obviously these are massive titles, they're not really, you know, based on indie games or anything like that. But the point we're trying to get is like, okay, if you know where these games fit in the landscape, this is what separates us from that. Again, this is really hard to do well. Like getting those axes correct and showing where your game fits, very, very difficult to do well. Where this is really helpful for you as the game developer is that you know, the publisher or the investor, the first thing they're gonna do is look at these titles and that's kind of how they're going to start their search to make an assessment of whether there's a market for your game or not. So it does two things. It's saying to them, hey, this is where we fit, and this is where you should start looking to understand that there's a market for our games. 
Now, it may be that they disagree that this is where your game fits, but if you don't give them a starting place, then they're much more likely to start somewhere else and disagree, essentially, for the wrong reasons. So what this shouldn't look like is a situation where you're just kind of, in every direction from your game, there's a better game that people could be playing. And even though you can have this space where you're like, well, you know what, this is actually where our game fits. And I know this is kind of silly and very subtle and a little bit stupid, but it's just visually much more appealing to people to see this in a space where like, you own this territory. You occupy that space of the market that you've defined. And it doesn't have to be as broad as hardcore or casual. You know? It can be very niche to your game, especially depending on the amount of money you're looking for. So traction and progress, you know, this is really just anything that you have, socials, awards, showcases at conferences, um, playtest feedback, really everything and anything. When we talk about the two levers that you can pull to reduce risk, one of them, will this game sell? You know, we had a game come into our system. This kid had about 750,000 people on his Discord. He had like 12 million TikTok followers or something. And as a publisher and investor, as soon as I see that, I'm not really worried about whether this game's gonna sell anymore. I'm just kind of interested in how do we get the game out there. And this is important for a few reasons. One is obviously it gives you a better chance of getting a publishing deal or an investor. Um, but you also get a lot more freedom if you build your own audience, right? Like all publishers are a bit different, but if you want the creative control and you're really interested in keeping that, you know, if we see someone that's got a big audience like that, we're not really tempted at any point to start saying, hey, have you thought about doing this? Or have you thought about doing that? I say we are a publishing community. We don't invest directly in games, but... Okay, comparable titles and sales. So pretty straightforward, but what's important here again is always start with the visual aspect. And then again, this is like, you're saying to the publisher or investors, like, hey, this is where you should start looking when you assess whether our game has a market. And what you want to do is have them scaling in success. So you want the first one to be somewhere, like if you took the price of that times it by the units, to be somewhere between two and three times the amount of money you're asking for. So this is a kind of baseline scenario. Then you want to go to somewhere between five to eight times the amount of money you're looking for. So just to reiterate that, units sold times price equals five to eight times the money you're looking for. And then you want to throw these really big, juicy ones at them at the end. So first one is like baseline. We're going to pay you back and you're going to make some money. Second one is this is a moderately successful investment for you. You know, by the time we have um, distribution fees, steam, the rest of it, plus the, the rev split, you're going to do three to five times. And then look how much fun this will be if we get to this other side. And like, you know, the reason these types of things are important is because in a deck, you're kind of revealing information to the publisher or the investor whether you know it or not a lot of the time. So when we see games that come in and their expected sales are hardly going to make money once we take away Steam fees, plus a 50-50 rev share or whatever it is, it's signaling to the publisher or investor that this is an inexperienced developer. Right? There's nothing wrong with being inexperienced, everyone starts somewhere. But in a pretty difficult sort of investment environment, the more of these red flags you have, it just kind of gives away a little bit of information about how professional or how experienced you are as a studio and your capability to really deliver on, on what you're promising. So again, this, what this shouldn't look like is, you know, like we need 500K and then look at these massive, massive games that are super successful. Unless you want like your you know, rich uncle to invest in your studio, this might be a suitable pathway, but all you're doing is demonstrating you don't understand your game, where it fits in the market. Um, game details, again, pretty straightforward. Um, 
Yeah, I don't think I need to explain that. It's pretty hard to do that bad. It's just a list. Budget. Um, again, what's important here is going to be some sort of graphic representation. And we talk about the little red flags that do or don't build over time. What the publisher or investor is looking to see is that does this make sense as a percentage of the total amount that you're asking for? So the first thing is like, how much is it? And what's the time frame? Does that seem plausible? But then how are they allocating this money um, in respect to the entire budget? So have they thought about where this money's gonna go? And again, typically at this point, the publisher investor is just kinda thinking in their head, does this make sense or not? And if it's wildly, wildly wrong, then it's, it's too difficult, they'll move on. And what you shouldn't do, which I see a lot, is this kind of option, like a menu for the game, you know? You just spent seven or eight slides explaining why this is such a great game, or it's a great investment, and then you go, look, if you wanted me to do it at this price, I could, or I could also, if you want, do it for this price, or I could actually also do what I really want at this price. So this is not the time to start giving the publisher options. You want to be very, very clear about the money you need to make the game that you're pitching to them. Can't stress how bad this looks, just in terms of the confidence that you have in yourself to perform, but I shouldn't have a choice as a publisher. The game is going to cost what the game is going to cost. Timeline, again, I'm not so much interested here in what you choose as the parameters, but what we want to avoid is kind of little things, the detail that you haven't maybe done this before or you haven't thought about a lot. So here the point is like, if I get you the money in March, the idea that you'll have a full team in April is just not plausible, okay? And again, this isn't like, it's not that this is the only mistake you can make here, but when we talk about those little things that add up over a pitch, it's kind of signaling that the, uh, yeah. you haven't really thought about or experienced what it actually means to get a team together or something like that. Well. Yeah, so this is another one where we talked about that risk of can you ship the game? Anything that anyone in your team has worked on, anything they've done, any credit they have in a game, any games you've shipped as a studio, this is all building that confidence that you can ship games, that you've done this before and you know what you're doing. So the most important thing here is to just stick up some titles that people on your team have worked with or that you've worked with. Even if it's work for hire, whatever it is you're doing in the gaming industry that demonstrates that you know how hard it is to make a game, but you can also commit and get that done is really what's going to help you. Okay, so we have something called the Funding Club. This is a free matchmaking platform. Um, it's free to apply. We play test every game that comes into the system. We have about 230 investors and publishers. Every game that gets uh, successfully kind of submitted or evaluated gets a profile. And then publishers and investors can basically filter through. If they like your game, they reach out to you. You guys take that conversation um, offline. We don't take a cut. We don't get involved. It's just a service to try and help um, help get games to market. So. I think there's a QR code here. Well, well, maybe it's after this. So just to conclude, you really need to think about building a business case for your game. Why is this a good investment? Be really, really focused on just getting a conversation. How do I get to that next space? And you know, I always kind of say like making games is a very, very hard thing to do. It's a challenging career to go down. So I think if you've kind of got the confidence you can make a game, then you should definitely have the confidence you can pitch a game. And that's not always the thing that you most want to be doing when you're in game development. Um, but as I said, if you can master this and get good at it, it gives yourself the best opportunity to make games for as long as you want to be making games, um, as opposed to having to leave because it gets too challenging. All right, that's the QR code if you wanted to um, go to the funding club. Got my email there, feel free to contact me if you've got any questions, or if you've got questions now, I'm happy to try and field those. That's it. Is this on? Are there any questions that I can give? How do you make a profit? How do you make a profit? How do you make a profit? We, yeah, so we work in payments. We um, process payments for video games. So any payments that occur off platforms, 
That's kind of how we make money. Um, publishers are very high targets for us because they handle a lot of games. And so there's two sides to this funding platform. One is the service to the developers and the other one's to the publishers because we curate games for them. So our motivation is to basically build relationships with publishers. Good question, though. Any other questions? One at the back, let me take your mic. Get all the way to the camera. Uh, thank you for all the insights, Nathan. I was um, super impressed by this one slide about how many titles actually being released uh, each year on Steam. Um, like, is it like is it still possible to actually bet on one platform anymore? Like, like only think of just I'm gonna have my game out on Steam, or like how much do you need to explain these days? How many bundles you want to be in? What are the three ports that you want to do? Like, like are people like. Can you even make a return on investment, to be honest? Yeah, uh, it's, yeah. it's crazy, it's crazy. Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, I think for the purpose of the pitch, you should be very focused on the game. Um, if the game's not successful on Steam or your first platform, it's highly unlikely to kind of translate well to somewhere else. And for most publishers and investors, it's kind of, you know, that alt, those other ports that may or may not occur are a little bit like DLCs. So it's like, it's cool to know that it's possible, but until we get a bit of traction with the game we've got, it's not super worth us exploring at this point in time. Now, you know, if you can put that in a slide or in the appendix and say, hey, this does translate cross-platform, that's always a bonus. Um, but I'd be pretty focused on just what is the game now? Why is it going to be fun? Why are people going to play it? And why are we the best people for that? I think with that Steam slide as well, you know, there's a lot of, you hear a lot of these really scary statistics like 90% of games make less than 5,000 euros in their lifetime. Um, a lot of that's true, but I wouldn't underestimate how many hobby games get released through Steam. So these are people that are doing it on the side, you know, it's not their core business. Um, you know, but it is, it is harder than ever to, to have a big hit on Steam. There's more people playing games, but there's a lot more games as well. Any final question? Yes. Yes. Here. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, my name is Koray. Ethan, hello. Thanks for your coming and giving us these insights. Um, we are currently building also a prototype and looking for funding soon. I've prepared the pitch deck uh, already, more to 95%, let's say. And I would like to know um, for the prototype testing the feedbacks of the playtesters. How many playtesters you should uh, usually have on a platform like Playtest Cloud, for example? With Playtest Cloud? It's for QA, I think, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. That I don't know. So when we evaluate the games, we have certain people that are doing the feedback on the games, and that's basically their job is to play the games professionally. Um, but I don't know what the best situation would be with Playtest Cloud. I think if you're looking to get that early traction and feedback, there's kind of the QA aspect, which is just getting the bugs out, but then also working on the core game loop and trying to find the fun. If you can open that up to your community as early as possible, I'd always recommend getting that feedback early in the process and a lot along the way. What tends to happen in games is when you're making them, you're so in them, you just can't see them anymore. You know, like you've got no idea what it's like to pick this up for the first time. So definitely iterating with that community is, is a thing I would recommend. Okay. Thank you. I'm not sure if that answered your question. But... Awesome. Then I believe that is time. So once again, thank you, Nathan, for teaching us about how to create the perfect pitch. Thank you.